And they asked someone, asked in the crowd, asked them about why was silver not on the, the, the critical minerals list. And he said, well, we didn't consider it. It's, an, it's, it's likely an error on our part. Um, uh, our, our, the, the list doesn't get updated until 2025. So we're going to review it uh, for, for the upcoming list. And uh, so we're lobbying uh, them to get silver on the U.S. list in 2025. But then we decided, hey, let's, let's start looking at Canada. The land of Arcadia. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And quite excited today because, as you can see, I have Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic Silver joining me and we're going to dig into a few silver related topics also touch on some first majestic progress at the end although main thing that I wanted to go over with keith and get your opinions on uh, is that you were part of a group that sent a letter to the canadian minister of energy and natural resources asking that silver be included on the critical minerals list obviously there's a lot of metals on there and we talk plenty about the importance of silver and going green and a lot of the other things that are happening in the world in the midst of a deficit, which not just reported by Silver Institute, but you had an interesting study you guys cited in the letter that was also coming to the same conclusion. So uh, Keith, it's great to have you here today. How are you? Well, it's great seeing you again, uh, Chris. Uh, good opportunity today. You know, gold's up big, silver's up big. So it's a great day to discuss, uh, you know, the metals and uh, what the, what's going on out there. Yeah, well, why don't we start with the letter and perhaps you could tell us how that came about. Again, as I mentioned, there are about 20 people from the industry that participated and perhaps you could let us know where that came from. And we were a little bit shocked when we saw the USGS, I think they call themselves, the United States government, whatever department it is, they came out with their critical minerals list last year. I think it was in July or August and um uh, it had copper on it, you know, it had zinc on it. It had a, a, a 50, min 50 minerals or 50 metals. And uh, some most people have never even heard of. They're on the periodic table, of course, but no one knows what the heck they're used for. Um, but nevertheless, those are, they had this list. And uh, so our, our our team here decided to take the bull by the horns. And uh, they contacted U.S. government like right away. And then one of the congressmen, they had a hearing um, uh, like a month later, and I could get you details if you really want, because there's actually a video. It's actually on, a, on YouTube, but you could see this guy, a uh, government official being interviewed. And they asked, someone asked in the crowd, asked them about why was silver not on the, the, the critical minerals list. And he said, well, we didn't consider it. It's, an, it's, it's likely an error on our part. Um, uh, our, our, the, the list doesn't get updated until 2025. So we're going to review it uh, for, for the upcoming list. And uh, so we're lobbying uh, them to get silver on the U.S. list in 2025. But then we decided, hey, let's, let's start looking at Canada because we heard through the, you know, uh, her, well, Jillian, our girl that's in charge of this, heard that the Canadian government's going to publish a critical minerals list in May of this year, May of 2024. And um uh, and she said, well, geez, you know, there's a great opportunity for her to jump on board. So she contacted all the government authorities. Uh, she contacted a bunch of silver mining companies. She got uh, 20 companies, including ourselves, uh, CEOs you know, uh, of, of these companies to sign a letter, which is pretty amazing that you know, all these CEOs actually came together. I was surprised that they all you know, put their signature on a, a letter like this, but they did. And uh the letter was submitted to the Canadian government, and uh, we've talked to them a couple of times since the letter was submitted. Um, there was a, a meeting just a couple of weeks ago. They're not telling us um, whether they're going to put silver on the list or not, but they are telling us that it's going to get published in May. So we're optimistic it's going to be there. We'll see. We do know France is also going to be publishing a cr critical metals list. We also think it's uh, Spain is also doing the same thing. There's a variety of European uh, countries that are also going to be published in the, these lists. Yeah, and actually you touched on what was going to be my next question there, if you've heard anything back. So it sounds like they're at least acknowledging that they are looking at it and considering mm -hmm. it, no decision yet. Mm -hmm. And 
Can you explain for people what would actually change if it does get listed as a critical mineral, how that actually, what they actually would conceivably do and how that would affect the market? Yeah, you know, there's there's differing views out there. Um, you know, some people, you know, think it's, you know, negative. Uh, you know, others think it's positive. Um, I personally think it's positive myself. Uh, um, you know, Canada and the United States, you know, we, you know, uh, we import a lot of silver. The United States actually imports silver. Um, uh, uh, and, and yet, you know, both Canada and the United States have, have large endowments of silver in the ground, but it's just not being mined. And it's not being mined because permitting takes forever. The costs are just, you know, outrageous, you know, to, to get metal out of the ground, um, you know, due to regulatory um, restraints and, uh, you know, all, all those types of issues. So, you know, if if, if the government could um, loosen the strains a little bit and then potentially speed up permitting for metals that are on the critical metals minerals list, um, that would assist the mining sector to meet demands that are currently there. It's obvious because we're in huge deficits in many of these metals. You know, silver is not the only metal that we're in deficits on, but um, uh, you know, we the mining sector needs to be supported more by governments, you know, to get these metals out of the ground and get them into industry and, uh, you know, do the green things that uh, the governments are pushing and, and uh, you know, the advancements of the electrical, you know, circuit around the world, you know, needs metal. And it's just, a, it's, you know, it's there's no way around it. So uh, we need more copper, we need more silver, we need more zinc. And these are metals that uh, the mining sector just doesn't really want to mine right now because there's just no money in it. Yeah, and it was interesting. I'll pull the letter up here again because one of the criteria that they have is required for a national transition to a sustainable, low carbon and digital economy. Certainly, we have seen that that is the case with silver. And then down here, mention something that you just spoke to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace reviewed silver. And the key takeaways was that they included an eight and a half percent silver deficit. If countries without free trade agreements with the USA are excluded and a 56 and a half percent deficit if countries with fragile democracies are excluded. So certainly in the midst of the plans to go green seems a bit significant. I'm curious if, if this doesn't get listed or let's say that things just continue on with the current arrangement we have and, Price sits around twenty five or thirty bucks. What do you think ultimately happens? I mean, how how do you see this playing out? Do we at risk of getting to a situation where there's a shortage and someone doesn't get their metal? Is that become an inevitability at the current dynamics well, that's lined up? You know, Chris, I think we're there. Um, uh, it, it, you know, these you know, where the silver is coming from, like who knows? I I, I remember that famous. I've said this before in other interviews, and I'll, I'll repeat myself. But um, I remember that famous uh, photograph of uh, Putin, you know, holding that gold bar. He was downstairs in in, in the uh, one of their big vaults, I gather, in Moscow, and uh, and I and it was quite fascinating. He was quite proud. You know, they were you know buying a lot of gold at that time. This is a few years ago, and um, uh, I looked at that. I zoomed in, and along the back wall was all these pallets of silver. And they go, wow, geez, that's a, boy, you know, that's a lot of silver. You know, I, you know, I couldn't add it up, of course. You know, who knows exactly how much silver was there? But it's non-reported. Um, uh, you know, we have a four hundred million ounce deficit last year, of which you know, one hundred and call it twenty million ounces was recycled. So call, call it a three hundred million ounce deficit, or even two hundred fifty million ounce deficit, whatever the number is. It's a big deficit. So, you know, these these ounces are coming from somewhere. Um, we do know that China is a buyer of silver and, and they don't export. It's illegal, actually, for China to export silver. Uh, we know India is an importer of silver. Um, the United States is, is an importer of silver. Um, so where it's coming from, God knows. But, uh, you know, there is a limit of, to the supply. You know, the, the, the ETFs aren't dropping. You know, the ETFs are around a billion ounces and, and have been around a billion ounces, plus or minus five or 10 percent over the last, you know, five years. So, you know, that's a pretty sticky uh, investor. 
Um, so the, the other hordes that are, are out there, and I guess are private hordes held by people that aren't disclosing or potentially governments, but you know, there's only so much. Right? And uh, you know, I think we're at a point now where people are waking up to, to silver. You know, uh, um, it's not performing as well as gold, but I still think it's going to. And um, I don't, I, I just think, you know, if, if we don't see $30 silver by the end of this year, I'll be very, very surprised. Yeah, and you, you mentioned India in there, and obviously I'm, I'm sure you saw they had that, what turned out to be a record monthly import figure of about 70 million ounces in February. So rumors, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but Alistair McLeod reporting that he's hearing that they had trouble sourcing some of their silver from refineries, had to go to COMEX. And certainly, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, we've seen inventories coming down around the globe over the past couple of years. And one of the things I was thinking about is you mentioned the deficit being reported at 250 million ounces, which, as you said, is quite large and also raises the question that let's say you had a $40 or a $50 silver price. Let's we'll assume for this example that mining costs haven't gone up any more than they have. But just at that level, and we'll again assume that it stayed there long enough that the industry feels that's a bit of a constant price. Still, even at that price, it would seem like 250 million ounces. You might not be getting anywhere near that. Is that fair to say? Uh, obviously, you see this firsthand every day. What, what kind of price are we looking at to get that much production? Which obviously, we're ballparking, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, but the, the the problem is that metal prices don't stay, you know, uh, at one price for extended periods of time. So you know, we, as a miner, you know, I've been in the mining sector for thirty five years, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, and we, you know, we try to do budgets uh, every year. You know, we have a big company that we manage. You know, we we have, I think, first Majestic's revenue was some somewhere north of six hundred million dollars last year. So, you know, there's a lot of money. We employ over 4,000 people. So, you know, there's a, a lot of moving parts in our business that we have to manage. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to guess is the metal prices, because that's where our revenues come from. And, and if we guess wrong, um, then all of a sudden that affects a lot of different things. So, you know, if, if we, um, uh, you know, predict, you know, $25 silver um, and, and then $2,000 gold, and next thing you know, silver's 22 bucks, you know, a, a company of our size, you know, just doing the math in the back of my head, you know, that's a $75 million revenue hit for us on a $3 move on silver. So all of a sudden, what do we do? We've got to start laying off people or we have to, you know, start reducing exploration programs. We got to, you know, whatever we have to do, right? Cut, cut costs somehow to make up for that loss of revenue. So, you know, and I've said many, many times over the last 20 years since I put First Sets together, because we're just this last September, September 2023, we just celebrated our 20th year anniversary. And I've said, you know, through that period of time, I say, look, give me $20 silver prices forever, and I can make a good business from it. Right. You know, just, you know, the fluctuations, you know, silver goes to, you know, when I put the company together, silver was five bucks. And I put it together based on my thesis that silver would reach its old high of 50, which it did. It took 10 years to get there, but I didn't expect it was going to drop all the way to 12. And, and that was devastating for everyone. Me, me neither. <laughs> yeah. And that was just ridiculous. And, uh, you know, we're at 25. 25 is a reasonable number. You know, we're, we're doing okay at 25. It's not fantastic. But, you know, if, 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 if governments want to achieve the objectives that they're pushing on all of us, which, you know, I think we're pretty well all supportive of, you know, we're, uh, for the most part, in Asia, we, we think that the, the electrical grid worldwide could be improved and we could do better things and, you know, better quality motors and, uh, you know, changing the grid and, and so on. All those are, are wonderful to, um, uh, goals to achieve. It's going to take a long time to do it. It's going to likely take 100 years. It's not going to be 2030 or 2040 or 2050. You're talking about changing the entire way of electrifying the planet. It took us 100 years to get to where we are today. It's going to take 100 years to change it. 
Um, so, so, but nevertheless, it's going to take a ton of metal and governments have to work with the mining sector, not against the mining sector, right? If we're going to achieve these goals together as a human race, we need to work together. Yeah, and especially if we get anything like what a recent report from Oxford Economics came out with, they were doing an analysis on growth in industrial demand over the next 10 years. Again, how the world changes over the next 10 years, we'll take it with a grain of salt, but at least to the degree that they did a solid research study. We forecast global output of end users of industrial silver will increase by 46% in real terms. So obviously we've seen growth already. We'll see if that manifests yet. Certainly a lot of demand oh, out yeah, there. That's, and that's, a, that's a crazy number. So we, we, we produced, no, well, the mining sector produced 820 million ounces of silver last year. The human race consumed 1.2 billion ounces. It's expected that we're going to consume 1.4 billion ounces in 2024. I don't know that the mining sector is going to produce more than what it did last year. Um, so call it 820, call it even call it 850, you know, whatever the number is. You oh. still have, you know, a, a, a huge deficit that's growing year and year and year. And that number, 46%, that you just flash up on the screen, you know, you know, back of my head, one 1.4 billion times 46%. Is again close to you know one to what almost over two billion. Yep. So so you're at two billion consumption. Where does it kind of come from? Well, that is the question that a lot of us in the silver community are wondering. And again, why I think it's great that you guys got together and sent that letter to the Canadian government. I think people appreciate that and that you're getting some attention on that and Certainly, we'll look forward to hearing when they have some sort of answer back. Although, in one other piece of news that came out earlier this week, I wanted to say congratulations as First Majestic Mint is now up and running. And I know you've been working on that for about a year. Talk briefly about that last time when it was getting close, but this came out just a couple of days ago. And perhaps you could tell people about having the mint open now. Yeah. No, well, thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Um... Uh, I was just there uh, this week. I was, uh, our, our team went, uh, flew down and uh, we just had a look at the first bars being produced. And uh, it took us a while. You know, build, building a mint is uh, a little bit more complicated than what I thought it was going to be. You know, it was my my idea. Hey, let's go build a mint. And uh, I figured it would take, you know, a few months to build it, but it took almost a year or so. Uh, but we're, we're, it's looking fantastic. All state-of-the-art equipment. It's, it's, uh, Quite wonderful. We're producing uh, five, ten, and uh, ounce bars plus kilo bars. We'll expand that line, um, but for now, we'll just be producing those three products. And we start sales, so sales are coming through the website. You're, you're on the first adjusted website right now. We actually the, the mint itself has its own uh, uh, mint now. There it is. There firstmint.com, and you, both both sites are currently live. There it is. There that's uh, that's our first run, uh, the first mint bars, and and. Uh, Within a couple of months, we'll end up shutting down the First Majestic site, and we'll just have this site. Uh, this site will be selling uh, First uh, uh, Majestic bars as well. Right now, it's just selling First Mint First Mint bars. So right now, we have the two websites selling silver products uh, that'll be merged into one in the coming months. So yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and I know a lot of the shareholders and people in the silver community again are often wanting companies to sell more direct to the public. So something that you guys are in the process of doing, I know you're at 10% now and possibly going to even increase that. So we'll keep an eye on how things come along there. Uh, a few well, let, quick... me, let, 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 let me tell you why, Chris. Yeah. You know, so we trade, like, you know, think, think about these numbers for a second. So the paper market trades a billion ounces a day yeah. okay, silver <laughs> billion ounces a day so the uh, call let's say there's 320 trading days of the year okay so that's 320 billion ounces of paper silver trade in the year you know rounded down to 300 million or 300 billion just for the hell, hell of it so you have 300 billion ounces of silver trading every year the banks know exactly what's coming to their doorstep. 
because they know the miners are, are producing 820 million ounces. So, and that, that those ounces are going to come through their door. And they know when those ounces come through their door and they're selling, pre selling those ounces in the paper market to commercial buyers. And, and as they write these contracts, it's in their best interest to keep the price relatively stable so, so that they're not offside on, on that order from Sony that just came in for 50 million ounces of solar to build their televisions. So, so the leverage, it just, you know, is something in the order of 400 to one. Yeah. So for every one physical ounce of silver being produced by a mining company, it's leveraged 400 times in the financial markets through the paper markets, right? So us as a mining company, we produce 10 million ounces of silver a year and uh, 25 million uh, equivalent if we include gold, but just on pure silver basis, 10 million ounces of silver. So that's being leveraged 400 times. So if I get the math right here, that would be 4 billion ounces of paper silver. So if we put all our ounces through our own mint, I'm removing 4 billion ounces of paper silver out of the market. Well, that's that's what always one of the things that always struck me about silver, where you don't necessarily need a big gap somewhere to have an issue with all of the leverage. And I think we saw maybe a, a little hints of that back in 2021. I thought it was interesting when I hear Rick Rule talk about how he was trying to find the 50 million ounces that they put into the PSLV. And he described, he said, we went to New York, cleared out, was there, Chicago, Ottawa, Montreal, Boston. And and you, th you see how the inventories have come down since then and that we're in a deficit. And if it was that tight back then, makes you wonder how tight things could conceivably be now. And certainly I uh, think that's nice that you're taking the metal direct. So... Um, one, two quick other questions before we wrap up. Just wanted to check in. Obviously, at La Encantada, you've had the issue with the water. I know that you've been doing drilling there and was just curious, anything in the last couple of months that you could update people on how things are coming along there? And also that you, in the last guidance, you mentioned that basically you've planned for a worst case. So anything that goes well there could be an upside. And so if you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I can tell you we've had some success in the last few weeks. Um, it's still not enough to, you know, hang hang our hat on and say we're we're good. Um, we're we are on the eleventh hole for water, which is quite a lot of holes. We didn't think we were going to have to drill eleven holes to find water. It was a little bit of a surprise to us. Um, we figured it'd be two, three, four holes, and we'd be done. Um, but um, yeah, it was. It, it was elusive. We had to bring in some experts and uh, to help us out. And uh, uh, the last couple of holes have been pretty good. There is water there. Um, we just need to pipe it. And that takes time. So there's, because um, yeah, these holes are spread out and you got to join, join them all to the system uh, uh, and put all the infrastructure in place. So that's currently underway, um, you know, based on, uh, I don't want to say too much because we, sh we need to put some news out to, to just, to make sure that we're good, <clears throat> but uh, we're 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 expecting by June, July that we should be back to normal. We're, we're crossing our fingers; it's not one hundred percent yet, but um, that's kind of our expectations. Okay, well, that certainly seems like good news, uh, especially based on the way you positioned guidance ahead of that. And the other thing I wanted to check in and in on was Jarrett Canyon. Obviously, you've been doing some exploration there and been. Gee, I guess it's almost about a year since now already since uh, the mine was shut down and anything that you guys have learned and discovered or and that you can share in terms of steps going forward. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, you know, been a, a definitely a learning curve. Um, uh, you know, I think the winters in northern Nevada surprised us. Um, I, 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 can, I can tell you it surprised our Mexicans. <laughs> we, 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 we brought up... Uh, a number of our talent from Mexico to work in Northern Nevada. That was quite, quite the interesting situation, but, um, the, um, um, we did unfortunately shut it down just based on cost and, and based on the amount of investment that was required. And 
we we had hoped that we could uh, uh, produce metal at the same time we improved the operation. And um, but it just proved to be too expensive, and uh, we had to um, uh, take a step back. So we're still doing all those improvements. Uh, we're uh, drilling will start, uh, I guess, in June. We have ten million dollars we're spending on exploration at Jared Canyon, which is a, quite a lot of money. Um, that's the largest drill pro program that we know of in at least fifteen years. And uh, our geos are pretty excited about it. They've got some ex high expectations. Uh, uh, a lot of untested ground we're drilling into, so we're crossing our fingers that that they pull off something that they're expecting, and uh, we'll know you know by the end of the summer, and then we're gonna have to make investments into the mill as well. So, you know, we're telling people that it's a 2026 um, story, uh, you know, back in production in 2026. We're hoping that's not too aggressive, um, uh, but that's the current expectations. Okay. Gives you a little time there and certainly will be exciting to see where gold and silver are trading by the time that rolls around. Uh, I guess that, that'll be the last one for you. Any thoughts on this rally that is a little different because we haven't seen the Fed say this or the Fed say that really as the particular driver and gold as we're recording on Thursday about 2240 about to hit the quarterly close and uh, hopefully that's leaving you smiling a little bit today. I know uh, First Majestic's share price doing well on on this Thursday. And any uh, final thoughts on the rally there? You know, I, I have to admit it surprised me. Um, uh, you know, looking I'm looking at the Kitco right now, and I'm saying twenty is twenty two hundred dollars. You know, plus oh, wow, that's you know what you know we we've been wishing for twenty two hundred dollar <laughs> gold for for ten years. So it's it's. Uh, it's finally here. Silver's uh, driving me crazy. It should be thirty, but it's you know barely getting through twenty-five. But uh, it'll 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 catch up. Um, you know, I think, but I honestly do think this is two thousand all over again. I still think that you know we've got we've got this. Um, everything is going up right now. We got the stock market going up. We got Bitcoin going up. We got gold and silver out. Like I, I don't think there's a single asset out there that's going down. Maybe, maybe real estate, uh, but uh, you know, I, but generally speaking, everything is going up. So everyone's making money. Everyone's happy. Everyone's you know, portfolios are been great. And I'm waiting for that shoe to drop. You know, and 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 uh, um, so I'm always suspicious. I've been in this industry for a long time. So you know, I'm waiting for the Dow to crack, the the Nasdaq to crack, and and uh, um, and and all that money to come floating into the resource sector, which will which is exactly what happened in 2002. You know, we hit, you know, the NASDAQ hit 5,000 in, in March of 2000. I remember that very, very clearly. And over the over the three years after that, the NASDAQ went down to 800, went from 5,000 to 800 in three years. And where did all that money go? It went into the resource sector and real estate. And because, uh, you know, people were going after real assets, they, oh, we can't keep investing money in these stupid high-tech stories and, you know, the, you know, the companies are losing money with with no revenues and all these storytelling. You know, uh, companies, blah 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 blah. And the market woke up and said, "We're going to stop investing in that group of assets, and we're going to start investing in mining." And all that money flew, you know, fl flowed into the mining sector. We had a ten-year bull market from you know 2002 to 2012, which was a, a spectacular market. You know, we've got gold went from 250 to 1900 and Silver went from five to 50, and you use those same kinds of numbers today. So that's 10 times on silver. Use, you know, call 20 bucks. If you want to call $20 10 times, that's $200 silver. You know, eight times on gold, you know, call from whatever number you want to pick. But, you know, those are big, big numbers. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's that impossible to see those kinds of crazy numbers on this next big run. Yeah, and especially with, some of the conditions out there that we discussed earlier, whether you do get an issue overtly with the supply, um, again, what what is the fair price versus what could happen in a short squeeze? It' interesting looking at what's going on in the cocoa market, and obviously in a chaotic market condition, a lot of things become possible. And Keith, in either case, I appreciate everything you shared here, and again, helping to lay out some of the dynamics going on and. Also discussing that letter, which uh, I appreciate that you guys put together, and I know a lot of other people do too. So 
I will mention that people can find out more information at firstmajestic.com. And Keith, any final words uh, before we close up for today? Yeah, people can follow me on Twitter as well. It's, it's just simple, just uh, 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 Keith underscore Newmeyer. On Twitter, I don't do a lot there, but, uh, you know, feel free to follow me there. But, uh, you know, if, um, I'm the chairman of First Mining Gold, um, a small development company that um, trading at stupidly ridiculous prices. And, of course, I'm the CEO of uh, uh, First Majestic Silver, founded both of those companies, you know, 20 years ago for First Majestic and uh, uh, 2015 for First Mining Gold. Yeah, so feel free to follow us and uh if you, have, if you do have questions, feel free to call us as well. All right. And I'll have the links to both his Twitter feed and First Majestic in the description field below. So, Keith, thank you again for making some time. Hope you have a happy Easter. Always great to catch up with you. And we'll look forward to doing this again soon. Yeah, it's great, Chris. Thanks for your time.